Hello everyone, my name's Adam. I'm a classic car enthusiast and owner and here to share with you today my 1969 Lincoln Continental Mark III. So special treat today for those of you who like, I'll call them mafia style cars. This is the pinnacle, I would say, of that. It would also be the pinnacle of what I would call a vacuum centric engineering. This car has a lot of vacuum powered accessories and also some very quirky engineering, which I will talk about as we go into the car in more detail. This car is finished in what Lincoln called maroon, which is a non-metallic, you know, burgundy color. I believe it's the same color as the black cherry paint that Mercury's use. They just called it a different name. And peeking in the garage, you can see a black cherry colored 68 Park Lane that appears identical to this in terms of color. So I believe it was the same color. But this is a burgundy, uh, or sorry, maroon paint with the red interior and then a black vinyl top. A few production statistics on this car. 1969 was the second best selling year for the Mark III. They made the Mark III from 69 to 71. And you can see that they sold 23,000 of these. So it wasn't a huge seller, but that wasn't bad volume for such an expensive car. You can see the price of this car, the base price was $6,800 in 1969, which was a lot of money. Um, and it has a very powerful premium fuel 460 V8 putting out 365 horsepower, which is uh, admittedly not uh, net horsepower, which is the ratings that they went to in 1972. But this would be the horsepower without all the exhaust and accessories and everything. So interestingly, as you go down from 69 to 70 to 71, the horsepower rating of this 460 stays the same. It was 365 in each year. But truthfully, the net horsepower just kind of decreased every year as more and more accessories and emissions controls were added to the vehicle. So of all the years, 69, I would say, is really the most truly powerful uh, of the, the three years for the Mark III. It's kind of middling in terms of the weight. You can see the weight, the curb weight was 47.62 pounds, not a light car by any stretch of the imagination, a bit heavier than the 70 but significantly lighter than the 71. And I believe they started putting more base content in the standard between 70 and 71, driving the weight up. So for comparison, you can see the first year of the Mark IV really increased the sales volume at almost 49,000. So it was a good seller, but it wasn't an overly great seller. And I'll flip back here just to compare to the Cadillac Eldorado of the year. So you can see what the production figures for that were. I also do own a 69 Eldorado, which I will feature in a different video, but similar production figures with 23,000 units sold per year in 1969 of the Eldorado. So selling about the same number of, of uh, units. Interestingly though, by the time the Mark IV came around and the new Eldorado had come out, the Mark IV was outselling the Eldorado by about 30%. I don't have the Marty report on this vehicle, but I do have from uh, Marty Auto Works, the original invoice from the factory to the dealer for the car. So you can see it's a maroon paint car. It has uh, leather uh, interior with the vinyl trim, black vinyl roof, the high torque axle, which is the three to one uh, open differential as opposed to the standard 275 to one, I believe which is kind of humorous because I don't think that this 460 needs any more torque multiplication than what it has, but that's what comes on this vehicle. White sidewall tires, which uh, on this car were actually triple stripe bias ply tires. I still have the originals. I think the trunk still has the original spare, so I'll show that to you because they're really unique. Like I said, they're triple stripe. For now, I'm just riding on standard single stripe white walls. Um, I wanted, I did not want to risk a blowout with really old tires. Power seats, tilt steering wheel, uh, cruise control, rear window defogger, automatic temperature control. This one does have the AM radio and eight track tape player. 
automatic headlamp dimmer, which is that little device here, which senses the oncoming headlights. And then if you have it turned on, it'll always have your brights on unless it senses light and then it'll automatically dim them and then go back to uh, bright lights once the light is passed. Tinted glass, headrests, the appearance protection group, which is the door guards and then power door locks. So this car totaled out at 6649, which is a lot of money. And that is the dealer invoice price. The retail price was $8,600, which was a small fortune in 1969, as you can imagine. So a couple humorous things here on the invoice, six gallons of gas, which they were charging the dealer six, uh, 30 cents a piece for, for gallon. So that's pretty humorous. Uh, dealer advertising fund of $35. So this is something that still exists today. There's a number of things on here that for those of you who haven't worked in a dealership or in the automotive space, you'll see hold back and option hold back. Hold back is basically an amount of money, in this case, about two and a half percent of the invoice price that is not something that's part of the, it's basically extra money that gets remitted to the dealer uh, after the vehicle is sold, but they don't have to pay commission on hold back money. So it's a way of almost protecting the dealer and its salespeople from itself and not selling below the true cost. This is something that's generally not visible um, in terms of the dealer invoice, but it's money that the dealer will get later. That's why it's called hold back. So for those of you who don't know, often people get coached to say, you should try to get a car close to dealer invoice. Well, there's a lot of things outside the invoice price that the dealer can, can get, like different incentives uh, that they might be able to claim back to the first vehicle they sold in the month, or this hold back money that's not part of the invoice that they get later on. This vehicle was sold originally to a dealer in Norwich, Connecticut. It still has a Connecticut plate from 1976 on the front that it had when I bought the car and I thought it was cool, so I kept it. Built in Wixom, just like all these vehicles, uh, all these Lincolns were. So I'll talk about some of the unique features of the vehicle because this is probably the most well-built mainstream American car that I've ever seen or owned. It's extremely well put together. It's, I would call it high tech for the day, um, complicated, but it is a beautiful car to ride and drive. So talking about the exterior first, maybe, it does have vacuum operated headlight doors and there's a big system, which I'll show you under hood that controls that you basically flip this dash switch in here and you pull it and the headlights will deploy. There's also a little light that goes on. You'll see it go off in a second when the headlight door is fully open. If I still have enough vacuum in the tank and I may not um, to suggest that the headlight doors are indeed fully open. So they must not be totally open. Oh yeah, they're not. Hence why that light is on. So I'll start the car up here just so you can see the headlight doors and you can watch this light go off. So there it goes. It's telling me to buckle my seatbelt and then the door jar lights on because I have the driver's door still open. Once I close the driver's door, you'll see that that goes away. You can see the headlights. And then if I push the button to close them, there they go. So we'll shut this off as I talk for a moment about some other features. As you saw on the window sticker, this car does have automatic climate control. So you move the temperature, you can choose between low and high fan speed settings, which it's not just two speeds. There's actually, I believe, four blower motor speeds. This just increases or decreases the voltage that goes to the mo motor 
as uh, it selects one of those speeds. So it's a bit faster on the high setting and a bit slower on the low setting. It does have a uh, the blower style rear window defogger, which I can turn on, you can hear. You can see the outlet in the middle there. You can also see when I step on the brakes, there are fiber optic lamps in the middle that you can see in your mirror to make sure that your brake lights are working. This car does have a, it says rear vent there. Um, and on the back package shelf, you can see that it has some ventilation louvers. So if you want to keep your windows closed and you want some better fresh air ventilation, you just turn this ring from open to, or sorry, from closed to open and it then opens you can see the louvers on the back that and it'll exhaust out on the rear package tray so really nice feature this is the selector for the automatic dimmer so you can have it off you can uh, determine if you want it uh, to kick on at when it senses light near or far away and again if you want it off you just leave it there these vents can be individually shut off with this little uh, pullout, which is a nice feature as well. The wiper system on this vehicle is very unique. It's continuously variable speed. So the wipers will wipe uh, slowly to fast, depending upon how you rotate this outer, uh, I guess it's this is the inner knob. So it's not an intermittent feature, it just changes how fast the wiper wipes across the glass, which is an interesting approach. And as opposed to being powered by an electric motor, the wipers on this car are powered off of the power steering pump. So yeah, with the car off, uh, you have no wiper power. Um, just an interesting approach and something that's very different from, from what you typically see. You can also see the full array of gauges on here. Some extremely thick piled carpeting, which is very luxurious. This is the intake air aspirator for the automatic climate control, which senses what the interior temperature is. The A-Track tape player is located here. And this is a AM radio combination. You couldn't get AM FM 8 track, you just get AM 8 track this year. So this buyer elected for that. There's a interior dash courtesy light here. Uh, there we go. This other switch moves the power antenna up and down. So you can hear it kind of, probably can't hear it extending, but I just pushed it and it started to go up push it the other direction and it goes back down until you hear a ratcheting click. So now it's stowed away. This is the cruise control on off switch, which is really interesting. You push it on to, um, to activate the cruise and at least turn it on. Then you push this lever at the end of the turn signal stock to set the speed and you pull it back to turn it off. This jewel light does illuminate. It's just a little faint to see in the bright light, but when you turn it on, this little light comes on and to, to show you that the cruise control is activated as well. It's kind of a nice feature. Another interesting thing about the 69 model year, it is the only year for hidden wipers and it's the only year for this interior trim. In 70 and 71, they went to different door panels, different seat patterns. What I, from what I understand, it's the first application where the factory designers tried to have this ruching um, purposefully included in the design to give it an overly rich look. And from what I've read about, a number of the factory um the seats that were sent to the factory were sent back because they thought that this was a defect and it actually was what the designers intended for it to have this rich gathered 
look, I think it would be called. So there probably was supposed to be more gathering on this rear seat and that look, this one really doesn't have much at all. My guess is that because of what I said, the uh, they were rejected and thought that thought that the seats were defective. So perhaps that's why they changed the interior after just one year. There are also many different variations of interiors on uh, the 69 Mark III's. Uh, just because it's a 69 does not mean that all interiors are alike. So you'll see the earlier cars like this one have these white uh, dial indicators. Uh, the later ones that are built later in the model year have orange or a yellowy color. This also has, um, well, so this has the early build uh, dials. This has a later build steering wheel, I believe. Um, sometimes you'll see a different steering wheel on these. And then later in the model year, they added some embroidery right in this area on the back seat, which this one does not have. So depending on where you are in the model year, you may have embroidery there. You may have different covered color dial faces. Um, and I believe you might also have differences in steering wheels. So I, I'm absolutely positive about the dial face and the embroidery in the back, but very strange. This is also the only year where this, uh, these wood panels are not real, they're fake. They are quite good and convincing. They're grained, they look nice, but in 70 and 71, those become actual real wood. So I don't think Ford believed that they could get the durability out of real wood and somehow they determined that they would try later on. On the door panel here, I'll close the door. Listen to how this door closes. I mean, it's just a solid, solid door. There's an interesting bypass switch here. You can see it says bypass. If you want to close the windows with the key in the off position, which is as it is now. So if I tried to, I guess, it, sorry, it's in the accessory position, I'll turn it off. So you can see the window won't operate right now. But if you hold this bypass switch, you can now operate any of the windows. So it's a nice feature when you don't have the key on to allow you to operate the windows. You can also lock them out for the passengers. The door lock system in this car is pneumatic. It is not electric. So when I push the button, you'll hear from down in this area, a little uh, air noise. You can hear it release. So as opposed to the later cars, the Mark IV had electric motors. This is vacuum operated. So this car has a lot of vacuum operated accessories, the door locks, the cruise control, the automatic climate control, among other things. Um, so very complicated. Thankfully, all the vacuum lines still work. You can imagine you have to run vacuum lines into the doors for this. And uh, I'm just thankful that everything on this car still works, including the automatic climate control and the air conditioning. So one last look, I showed you this header panel with these lights. A lot of room in the front seat, not a lot of room in the back seat, but a really intimate and beautiful compartment back there. There's a switch for the lights, a switch for the power windows. There's the reading light that's in the C-pillar. A very rich headliner on these, uh, some sort of a woven fabric. It looks very expensive and rich. Overall, this car, the attention to detail and the way it's put together is, to me, just blows my mind. It's, it's, I have a 69 Eldorado, and while that's a nice car, this car just surpasses it in smoothness and uh, material quality, I would say, by a long shot. The Eldorado does have a great engine and transmission, though. Some courtesy lights in the doors and a nice brushed aluminum panel on the door with the speaker grill um, for the AM radio as well in there. This is the, I think it's called the Cavalry Twill vinyl roof this is a factory vinyl roof and they're only padded on uh, the side of the, of the roof uh, i would say to the side of the seam so this area is padded this is not 
that's one way that you can tell aside from this interesting grain it kind of has a very linear shape to it if the vinyl roof is original one thing i'd advise if you have one of these cars is don't wash the top of your car just wipe it off with a damp rag water comes down and collects down here and you'll see a lot of these cars where they'll have bubbles and pock marks down here where rust is forming under the vinyl top this one somehow must have always been garaged and there is no bubbling at all and I try to preserve that as best as I can. This is the rear window louver that exhausts out the cabin air when you have that vent switch turned on. There's the area where it takes in the air from uh, inside the car. Let me grab the keys here so I can show you the trunk. Another interesting thing about 69 only is the key position is way down here under the dash which I guess is a nice anti-theft feature if uh, somebody's trying to take your car although you can hotwire these cars very easily hard to find where the key placement is nothing on the steering column in 70 they went to the, the column placement pretty good sized trunk in this car especially compared to the Mark IV, which is tiny. Um, the Mark IV, the fuel tank, is underneath the trunk pan, so it doesn't have this deep well like this vehicle has. Uh, it's more of a shallow well because the Mark IV, although was, the platform was shared with the Thunderbird, it's based on the Torino. It's actually a gussied up Torino that they used for the Thunderbird and the uh, Mark IV. This Mark III platform is totally different and is shared with uh, the Thunderbird, but I think that this is a more expensive platform and more well done. And let's see if I can, uh, I can't easily get this cover off to show you the spare tire under there, but you can look up pictures of the, the, um, the car with its factory tires and see the triple stripe white walls. By the way, there's no spare tire under this one. This is all just looks. Nicely integrated reverse lamps into the bumper. You can see the hubcaps on this car. These hubcaps, I shouldn't call them hubcaps, wheel covers are extremely heavy. Uh, certainly not something they would do today from a weight perspective, nor would they have doors that are this thick. I mean, look at how thick that door is. A lot of times these cars have some glass alignment issues where this glass will be too far forward or back or won't touch the window stri rub strip. I think what happens is when people close the door, they don't push here, they push on the glass and over time it just walks the glass forward and back. There are bolts on the bottom of the door that you can use to readjust the glass. I had to do that on this car. So now all the windows seal correctly. That was not easy. Um, <laughs> Not much on this car to work on aside from basic tune-ups is easy. Speaking of which, I had to replace the headlight motors, which I showed you are vacuum actuated. Um, I replaced them with units that these have an internal spring that when the vacuum uh, is lost, the headlight doors open. So you'll see a lot of these with the doors open. Uh, I bought and uh, these from a rebuilder who highly recommended taking that spring out. It really doesn't do anything. And now they stay closed forever. I can have the car shut off for a year and the headlight doors will never open and they operate just as well. So highly recommend that if you have one of these cars, get a set of rebuilt motors that don't have those springs in them. Otherwise you're gonna still be chasing down other vacuum leaks. I have not had any problem with these and they operate just great. The dealer added this hood ornament on. Uh, this is not correct. It's actually the old Lincoln logo. The Mark III was the first use of this newer style Lincoln logo. Customer must have wanted it. I think it looks good. In the early prototypes, they actually had that hood ornament on them and it got taken away for safety standards. Remember this was when, around that time when Ralph Nader came out with the book, Unsafe at Any Speed. So all the car companies got rid of their hood ornaments out of fear of liability that they were going to be uh, potentially sued because they could impale people. 
Interestingly, I think by 70, 72, 71, 72, the hood ornaments started coming back. Um, but you'll see it for a period of time there in the late 60s, early 70s, that all the hood ornaments left. And then as an example, like my 76 El Dorado had a big old hood ornament just like that. So I've kept it as opposed to returning it to stock because the early design photos I've seen of this car actually had that hood ornament and it got taken off for safety reasons. So um, it seems to be in character with what the designers wanted. So I mentioned this is the only year for the the non-hidden wipers, the 70 and 71, have those wipers um, tucked under the hood. So let's open the hood now. And there's the premium fuel 460 V8. Again, an extremely powerful motor, very, very smooth. I mean, just a joy to drive. A couple tips I would say uh, for those of you who have who have these motors, uh, make sure that your radiator is not clogged. I've had this one record when I'm running the air conditioning uh, in the summertime. It never really got hot, it just got hotter. It's still the original radiator in it after all these years. This car only has about 35,000 miles on it. But um, I put this record radiator in and uh, the car doesn't get anywhere near hot at all. You want these to run cool. I have a 160 degree thermostat in here and you want them to run cool because they're high compression and they tend to spark knock very easily, even with premium fuel, if you're running the stock timing. So uh, I would, I, I run this one with premium fuel plus a couple gallons of racing fuel plus lead additive. And while that sounds excessive, uh, I want this motor to last a long time, and that's what it takes for it not to spark knock with the stock timing. So uh, it is what it is. It's a joy to drive, and uh, I don't mind it. You can see the air conditioning I've unhooked. It's still cool here in Michigan, and when you have the auto climate control on, the air conditioning always operates, and I just don't want it always operating. Uh, when the weather's cold outside, I'll plug it in as the summer comes comes back. It's just one wire, very simple to disconnect and reconnect. These cars, if you're looking for the voltage regulator, it is not integral to the alternator. Uh, this car, when I got it, had an overcharging problem. I was searching for the voltage regulator and it's actually on the back of the alternator. There's a little black plate and I was able to find one on eBay. So just a tip for those of you, if you're searching for that voltage regulator, it's it's on the back of the alternator and it's removable. So make sure that you're not overcharging your batteries. This is one of the reservoir tanks for the vacuum system. There are others, there's another here. Here, this is interesting. This is the power steering reservoir and that is just a reservoir. There is no pump right there. In 69, the power steering pump is actually on the front of the crankshaft. And this was something that Lincoln had back to, I believe, the 430 V8 when it was introduced in 1958 did that. And they kept it through 69, it was the last year. And then, then there's an accessory driven pump that's in this area, but there's no belt down there. It is just a reservoir. And the pump again is on the front of the crankshaft. So some unique engineering. There's the cruise control servo. and uh, the distributor cap. A lot of times these distributors get stuck. I highly recommend every couple years, you just rotate them back and forth and then reset the timing. Otherwise they have a tendency to stick in place and they can be a bear to get unstuck. This one, thankfully, when I bought the car, wasn't stuck too much. Sometimes you can lightly tap with a hammer on this vacuum advance in both directions and it'll free it up. If that doesn't do it, um, Sometimes there's a tool you can put on here, like a clamp with a slide hammer and yank this up to get it loose. Uh, but it is, again, it's just good preventive maintenance. If you, if you move that distributor around every couple years, you're not gonna have that problem. So I always just, every couple years, loosen the hold down bolt, move it back and forth, maybe about 10 times, then get it back roughly in the same position, start the car, set the timing, tighten it back down. 
Another tip, check your fan clutches uh, to make sure that they are enabling the fan to rotate at appropriate speed when the motor's warm. These fan clutches just don't seem to last like the GM vehicles. So I finally go out around 40, 50,000 miles and you'll see the fan just doesn't turn very fast. Even when the motor's hot and the air conditioning's running, they're very easy to replace. So be sure to check that. And again, you know, check your radiator to make sure that uh, it's, it's allowing the car to cool appropriately. Don't think I have any other tips under the hood here. There are a couple witness marks still from the factory showing. It's a very, very clean car. I bought it from the son of the second owner in Michigan. So I don't know, the owner had passed away. The son didn't know much about it. So I don't have much of the history, but it's very clearly a low mileage car. And none of this stuff has been a part. When I replaced the headlight motors, which are down here, none of that had been a part. They were all original. It still, the car still has the original headlights in it. A lot of times these exhaust manifolds will crack, particularly on the passenger side. So if you hear an exhaust leak, I've had to replace this one. Um, just something to be aware of. Other than that, I'll just start it up one last time so you can hear the motor run. It is cold, so it'll be on fast idle. This car did have dual exhaust from the factory with resonators, which I have replaced and put stock ones on. You can hear it's really quiet, even in fast idle. I should also note, for those of you who have Fords of this era, you really shouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now. Do not operate these cars before 1972 in park unattended. They did have uh, issues with the cars jumping into reverse and uh, you'll notice that the later Fords like at 72 this gear shifting mechanism becomes very notchy for that reason but in this year you know I can just kind of glide through all the gears there's no notchiness at all um, but one thing you should check is make sure that when the car's in park if you just slightly tug on this uh, park lever that it doesn't go into reverse. What you'll find is on a lot of these cars, if you do that, it will go into reverse. So this column is what holds the car in park and that park lock wears out over time. Uh, and then it just enables it so that you can go like this and then you'll tap it into reverse. So I highly, highly recommend two things. One, don't leave these cars unattended running in park. And uh, number two, just check so that you're aware if your car is really prone to do that, push on this a little bit with some light pressure. Don't yank on it, you'll end up breaking the lock, but make sure that it actually does hold and park. I do have some, one of my vehicles where that is not true. So I just always make sure not to leave that one running and unattended um, for that reason. So I just want everybody to be aware of that. You'll see some of the later Fords you'll buy from the 70s, we even have a sticker that's put on the dash by the dealer somewhere that says not to do that. And it's because of these cars. It has a great feel to it. And the later ones are super notchy and they feel clunky, but this one is not as safe as the later Ford. So just want everybody to be aware of that. So that's it for this vehicle. Hope you enjoyed this video. And if you liked it, subscribe to my YouTube channel where I will show you more vehicles. So far I've only displayed Fords, but I have GM vehicles too and I'll get those out soon. Thank you and subscribe.